10. Painting Veins Back in the 17th century in Europe, many people believed that extreme paleness was just the hottest thing. If you looked whiter than a ghost, then you were like the Megan Fox of the town. Many women were obsessed with finding new ways of making themselves look pastier than a white wall, and some of their methods were actually surprisingly creative. The cosmetic skills of women back then were actually pretty impressive, I must say. Wealthy aristocratic women were the ones who took part in this pale trend the most. They wore dresses with plunging necklines to show off the girls, and they painted themselves white using a powder. Frankly, this powder made them look pretty artificial, like you could tell that they weren't actually naturally that white, so to solve this they came up with a new beauty trend. Drawing veins. Women would draw veins on their mommy milkers using a blue color to mimic the look of translucent skin. It's crazy to think how far we've come from this, because back then people were trying to look as pale as possible, and now we have people tanning themselves so much that it causes controversy. Number nine in the countdown is women and their flirty fans. When you see a gentleman caller across the room, you may want to send him a hint that you're picking up the vibe that his top hat is putting out. What better way than sublimial messaging with an item you're already carrying. In Victorian times, women carried fans due to fainting spells, which were really just the result of their excessively tight and heavy garments, something we'll cover later in the video. In 1827, a fan maker from Paris, Double Roy, published a leaflet explaining the language behind the uses of a fan. Some examples were twirling the fan in the right hand meant that I love another. Meanwhile, drawing the fan across the cheek told someone special that I love you. A fan half opened and pressed to the lips gave permission for a kiss. However, it is rumored that the less romantic truth is that the fan etiquette, such as Duval Roy's leaflet, was invented in order to boost the sales of fans in the 19th century, after they had fallen out of fashion following the French Revolution. Irregardless of rumors, it appears in olden times some people were using fans to get hot, rather than cool down. Speaking of keeping it cool, next in our countdown at number 8 is bottomless underwear. While showing a bit of ankle may have made you a harlot, in the Victorian era every woman was walking around with crotchless undergarments. But these strange underoos were invented with a justified purpose. Due to the amount of fabric layers, steel crinolines, and tight bodices and dresses, women of the era didn't really have time to spend an hour undressing before nature calls. By creating undergarments that had holes aligned with the wearer's groin, a woman's only mission would be to hoist up as many layers as she could before popping a squat. Don't be fooled however, that wasn't exactly easy either. Some of you may wonder, what happened if Aunt Flo paid a visit while a woman was wearing an open bottom undergarment? Well, well, in Victorian times, menstruation hygiene was perceived very different, and women quite literally let it flow. If you want to learn more, search that one up on your own. As fashion evolved and women wore fewer and lighter clothes in the early 20th century, pulling down undergarments from underneath bustles and cages was no longer a nightmare, so the crotchless undergarment was soon abandoned once more. But now it does make sense why everyone loved the high kicking can can dancers in 19th century Paris. Morning garb, and I don't mean pajamas, is number seven in our countdown. Known as the monarch of mourning, Queen Victoria influenced how grieving women dressed and behaved in Europe and the United States after the passing of her husband in 1861. She famously mourned him for 40 years until her own demise, and started what's now known as the Victorian mourning etiquette. Victorian mourning etiquette came with elaborate rituals to commemorate their dead. It became normal to have incredibly elaborate and lavish funerals, curtail social behavior, and even erect statues and ornate monuments as tombstones. Mourning clothes were part of this, and they were introduced for both sexes. Set to show a family's outward display of their inner feelings after the passing of a loved one, the rules for who wore what and for how long were complicated and often outlined in popular journals or household manuals. Call that a mourner's magazine. Jokes aside, men definitely had it a lot easier. They simply wore their usual dark suits along with black gloves, hat bands, cravats, or ties. For women, especially should she be a widow, there were different levels of mourning and garb to wear as you progressed out of deep mourning and into lighter mourning and so forth. Deep mourning uh, was of course black, but also made specifically was a crepe styling, a scratchy silk with a puffed crimped appearance associated with mourning as it doesn't pair with any other clothing. Right. The mourner would eventually stop donning the crepe and then stop donning black. This was called slightening the mourning before cloth colors eventually moved on to gray, mauve, then white until the mourning period was considered complete. Number six in our countdown is the human hair wearers. Fun because it rhymes, but creepy for a whole slew of reasons. So what do I mean by human hair wearers? Well, it was a tradition in Victorian era to don jewelry that had segments of human hair embossed, woven, or sealed into it. But for many Victorian people, the amount of hair 
care involved in remembering loved ones went far beyond a little lock in a necklace. In stores and women's magazines, you could find patterns for wreaths made of hair and wire, often floral designs. Bracelets, brooches, earrings, and necklaces were also all very common. In its prime, human hair, jewelry, and decor was considered incredibly fashionable. It's even said that swapping locks of hair was a love token between women loving women or friends, the way that girls today might wear friendship bracelets with each other. I guess if you need a trim and you were already late on a birthday gift, you could really just kill two birds with one stone. Number five in the countdown is all about buggy dresses. The wealthy Victorians were very into the grandeur, looking to feed a fascination with culture, especially. Beetle wing embroidery was at a peak of fame in the 18th century India and was quickly appropriated by English visitors while military occupied the country from 1858 to 1947. Elytra, which is the hard casing over a beetle's wing, first appeared on dresses and experienced their first burst of popularity in England by the 1820s, though English women in India had likely been donning it since at least the 1780s. Material used was often white or other pale colors to help augment the reflective green tones of the beetle wing. This visual was made possible when Elytra was paired with Zardozzi, a gold embroidery style often done on colored cottons or silks. Victorians at least didn't appropriate everything about the art form. They made patterns and styles of their own for the dresses. Elytra was sewn onto the gowns in an imitation of live beetle patterns, a reflection of Victorian interest in naturalism and zoology. Not sure why anyone wants to look like they have live bugs crawling on them, but okay. Number four is the casual ball gown. One of the most notable shifts in Victorian time was that fashion began to be differentiated by gender rather than class. This reflected the changing roles of women in society. And let me say, every part of Victorian women's fashion seems tortuous. You start your day layering on long crotchless underwear and tunics before strapping a metal cage to your waist. You then wear an average of six skirts over that, alongside bodices and corsets that would forever change the placement of your organs and potentially even suffocate you to death. The reported average weight of a Victorian dress when fully on could be anywhere between 14 and 22 pounds. But the risk doesn't end there. In fact, it was everywhere. It was estimated that between the 1850s and 1860s, 3,000 women in England died from their crinolines catching fire, as airy fabrics and hoop supported skirts also allowed for plenty of air to circulate beneath a dress, which could also make a small flame grow out of control in seconds. In 1864, the New York Times reported that 40,000 women worldwide perished from dress related fires. Another common occurrence was to see them pulled into machinery after walking too close and having some of the skirts catch in exposed parts. Yikes. It's no wonder that the large ball gown crinolines phased out in the late 1800s, but then bustles came in and they were worse in different ways. While more practical as it was slim on the sides and the front, it required women to sacrifice movement and comfort in order to achieve a fashionable shape like the corset did. They began to alter women's spines, ribs, and organs over time as they required women to twist their bodies completely in order to be able to sit down. Overall, while movies and TV may make these beautiful gowns seem whimsical and ethereal, they truly were just death traps. Number three in the countdown is bird brained. I enjoy my puns, but there's a reason for that one. This trend was started by the notorious Marie Antoinette, a rebel in the French courts for her outlandish fashion and accessories. Amongst her pile of powdered curls, Marie was often seen with feathered caps and bonnets. While this look became an envy for women across America and Europe, the trend did struggle to take off initially as much of the aristocracy was perturbed by it. However, a trend is a trend, and eventually the English society was persuaded. They donned mainly ostrich, pheasant, or peacock feathers at first. Eventually entire songbirds were stuffed after their death and adorned these hats. By the late 1800s, the plume trade had decimated several species of birds, including flamingos, birds of paradise, and rosy spoonbirds. Topping the endangered list were the snowy and great egrets, as at one point their pure white feathers were worth more than gold. Promoters of the feather trade knew what they were doing and also knew that the public didn't understand the carnage that their fashion was sieging on these animals. They held that wearing feathers and whole birds brought city dwellers closer to nature, that it improved people's awareness and knowledge of bird species. Thankfully, it's due to the inevitable public awareness and then disapproval 
approval, that bird hat sales diminished and went out of trend altogether. Number two slot in the countdown is Paris Green. It seemed Parisian aristocracy had a chokehold on the globe with their trends. It's believed Empress Eugenie was to have worn a dress so stunning at the Paris Opera one evening in 1864 that it was featured in newspapers globally the next day. It was a deep yet vibrant green, one rumored to almost glow in darkness. The green of Paris quickly became the hue of the social elite. So how was Paris green made and why was it so dangerous? The color was discovered when chemists combined copper and arsenic poison. The result was a dye brighter than all the other greens available on the market. Copper wasn't what gave this color its iconic nickname however. Arsenic is a highly hazardous substance that causes skin sores, vomiting, diarrhea and in some circumstances cancers or death as we know now. But they didn't. When factory workers arms and hands began to wilt away from sores and decay that could only be connected to the dye, French and German governments enacted legislation prohibiting the production of arsenic based pigments. It's the right thing to do. Meanwhile, the British government mainly ignored them. Even when Matilda Schreuer famously died of arsenic poisoning with the whites of her eyes stained green from her working in factories. This was deemed accidental poisoning by the government at the time. Paris green remained popular in England until ironically it just went out of trend. It's a little bit of an abrupt ending honestly. No justice for those exposed in workplaces or compensation for suffering. And finally coming in at number one, deodorant. What did people even do before Old Spice? You know, before that guy was born, how did we know how to smell good? What did we know how to do? Deodorant was first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s and it was called Mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide and it was stored in metal cold containers. That's just not nothing like speed stick at all. It's not discreet in any way, shape, or form. It wasn't long until the first antiperspirant came along right after it. It was called Everdry, and it was always damp, ironically, and it would always burn your underarms. It literally would eat through your clothes. I think at that point, I'd rather smell bad. Like, let me have rashes, let my face look horrible, let the bags show. I don't, I'd rather do all that than any of this. This is horrible. Kicking off the list at number 10, skincare routines. For a long time now, having pale skin in Europe meant that you were among the wealthy. Because in the 17th and 18th century, this suggested you could enjoy the indoors. You didn't get sunburns working outside all day, aka wealth. Keep in mind, this was long before sunscreen was ever even a thing. So at the time, the best thing to wash your face with was something called chemical wash. That was a mighty wash. This thing packed a punch, that's for sure. This wash would ideally get rid of sunburns, pimples, ringworms, smallpox, scurf, or morphew. I don't even know what scurf is, but it sounds awful. I don't want it. And your skin afterwards would be pale and literally glowing. Thing is, all these foundations were made with old timey, horrible, poisonous recipes. One of these facial creams, I swear, I'm not making it up, was literally this. Steep the lead in a pot of vinegar and rest it in a bed of horse manure for at least three weeks. What? I'm trying to get rid of bags under my eyes. How am I supposed to steep lead? What am I, Walter White? I don't know how to steep lead. I can barely steep tea, let alone lead. Moving on, I'm upset. Number nine, natural or painted. Today the internet is full of makeup tutorials in every corner. Doesn't matter what style you're looking for, help is now available. You can learn how to draw on eyebrows while listening to a true crime story. You know what I'm saying? It's perfect. The makeup game is crazy, but back in the 1800s, you only had two looks to choose from, really. You had the painted look or the natural look. Natural was light on the makeup, more of a paste look than anything, almost like you're a Victorian painting, you know? One of those? But to achieve the lighter look, Europeans would use actual paint, like paint paint. Just lead based paint. And the most important part of applying this is that you can't smile. You can't even move at all. Any emotion will cause the paint to literally crack. Again, that's why all these paintings are so serious. Madame X, the portrait of Virginie Amélie Avegno Goutreau, originally painted back in 1884. At first, Sarjan made the woman's strap slipping off her shoulder. That was a little, you know, scandalous, a little oopsies. That was deemed too scandalous for the upper class society around him back in the 1800s. So John had to literally repaint these straps back on. Yeah, backlash was so strong, John had to move after he sold the painting. Guy left Paris because of spaghetti straps. What a nightmare. But this is what I'm talking about. You start drawing veins on pale skin, people would lose their mind. Love that pale veininess. Number eight, beauty patches. 1800s beauty patches came in many different shapes and sizes. Take this portrait from 1755, for example. Joshua Reynolds painted Charles the Ninth, Lord Cathcart, rocking a pretty large beauty patch. The guy literally looks like the rapper Nelly. 
That's massive, it looks like a band-aid on his cheek. Whereas other fabrics used in the 18th century were much smaller. There were tiny circles, hearts, stars. If you found this, you'd think somebody was gearing up to go to an Arctic Monkeys concert. They were often used to cover up smallpox scars. They were made out of silk velvet and they were applied with glue. Now the patches were dark black to make the pail pop, but the location of where these went also had purpose. A beauty patch in the corner of your eye meant that you had a lot of passion. On the forehead, that was meant to be majestic, and a dimple patch, oh, well, you're a cheeky one. That's uh, the scandalous one you are. The position of these patches could also determine your political allegiance. Historian Joseph Addison took notes on these positions when observing two parties from the 1800s. One party had patches on the right side of their face and the other had the opposite. That's like switching jerseys back in the 1800s. You're like, ah, this team sucks. Number seven, mouse skin eyebrows. Okay, Stuart Little, if you're watching this, skip to number six. You don't wanna see any of this, all right? Trust me, it's not good. Back in the 1800s, as I mentioned earlier, the cosmetic game was harsh, to say the least. The eyebrows too, they had a rough go. Eyebrows were completely plucked off back then in order to make the forehead bigger. Yeah, you need that 1800s five head. That's the trick, apparently. Imagine if I shaved my eyebrows off and then painted my face like pale white. Honestly, I'd do it for the clicks. I'd do it for you guys. This five head look didn't last forever, thankfully, but for a hot minute, it almost got worse. In the late 17th century and early 18th century, these leading ladies would shave off their eyebrows and then they would glue on mouse skin to replace them. Like a band-aid, only horrible and stinky. Since their face was freshly painted and the glue game was weak, they would have one shot only to stick these puppies on. You just gotta eyeball it and hope that it works and that it looks in the right spot. I don't know. You put them on too low, you're gonna look upset all day long. Eyebrows are angry sisters, not angry twins, okay? Remember that. Number six, lip paint. Red lips always lie, especially when you don't know that ammonia is mixed in with it. How jolly. Back in the Victorian era, the pale look, red lips, beauty marks, you were trying to look like a literal queen. That was the whole point. So women in the 1800s would either make their own compound themselves, which didn't work, obviously, or if they had some money, they would buy some. The main ingredient in these days were not ideal. Crushed up insects, which already could cause allergic reactions when applied to your lips, but the ammonia mixed in really put the nail in the coffin at that point. Ammonia and crushed bugs? What am I, oogie boogie? What am I making here? What am I applying? Number five, corsets. I can't even imagine how hard it was to wear one of these. Like, I have no chest. I'm just a diving board. And already, this is a nightmare. I can't even imagine. The Victorian corset, okay. <gasps> Tiny waist, curves, look, the whole thing. Obviously, this was horrible for your body. Just looking at this, you're like, ugh. Your ribs would literally slowly deform, as well as your spine misaligning. But instead of talking about how horrible this obvious one was, let's talk about that corset duel from 1836. Yeah, have you heard about this? That's a real thing. Hungarian princess Pauline von Metternich was married to Prince Clemens. She had to marry her uncle when she was 20 back in the 1850s, so surprise, surprise, she was a little unhappy. Weird, right? So since the marriage began, her husband, he was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, whatever. He barely paid any attention to her. That is until, you know, she started to have fun in life. Then he's like, ugh, what are you doing? Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she defied convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess, to a duel in nothing but a corset. How badass is that? To this day, it's not yet determined who won, per se, but a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks? Yeah, that should be a musical. Forget Frozen. I wanna watch this on DVD, let's go. Number four, Deadly Nightshade. Macbeth's soldiers used Deadly Nightshade to poison their enemies. And during the Victorian age, women would apply Nightshade to their eyes, just so they look nice. Awesome, so this is horrible, let's talk about it. The pupils would become larger after this, okay? That was the whole point of putting poison in your eyeballs. The thing that makes Deadly Nightshade so commonly known is the sweetness of the berries. Have you ever been outside and you see a berry and like 30% of you really wants to eat that berry? Well, curiosity kills. Deadly Nightshade can be found in Europe, Asia, and Africa. It grows purple flowers in groups of three, along with those inviting purple berries. Just two to four berries can kill a human being, so don't, when in doubt, just don't eat them. And the flower as well, don't ingest this, you'll get poisoned. And also, don't put any near your eyeballs, in this century or the next. Number three, bustles. So while corsets are one nightmare, bustles are just an entirely new thing. 
Tiny waste wasn't enough, eh? Had to get big old dump trucks as well. These Victorian folks went hard in the paint. Figuratively and literally, I guess. Bustles were also known as the Grecian Bend. Big old booty bend, that's it. It came to town in the 1870s and it took the idea of wearing a cage as a skirt to just having the back part extend out. Ah yes, an update, an upgrade, I guess. Then the fabric was draped behind the butt. Hope you don't like sitting down ever, because that's obviously not an option. Corsets would move your organs around slowly, and bustles would slowly damage your back. So let's leave this one in the 1800s. I think that's probably for the best. Number two, red lead redemption. Look, I'm pretty new to skincare routines, but I'm trying, okay? I'm trying to get rid of these bags under my eyes. I'm trying to sleep and drink water, all that jazz. Back in the 18th century, those bags under your eyes were a lot harder to get rid of. Lead mixed with vinegar, this would make you look more pale. If I used this, I would literally be a ghost. I would just be invisible. I would, you would just hear a voice in a green screen right now. In the 18th century, that pale look was ideal, but this lead vinegar mix also smoothed out your face. So, what could go wrong, right? Queen Elizabeth I used cosmetics containing lead, mercury, and arsenic. Those powerful three things you don't want anywhere near your face. Yeah, arsenic too, the same deadly poison that took out George III and Napoleon Bonaparte. Just the worst ingredients in the 1800s cosmetics game, really. The Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry has arsenic on its priority list of hazardous substances. Toxic metal exposure is still an issue we're facing today in this century, so I hope this is eye-opening. Sans poison eye drops, I hope it's eye opening. But nothing takes the cake quite like the Victorian trend of looking dead, which is number one in our countdown. You'd figure people look dead enough as is, inhaling arsenic and mercury from their clothes and shoes and hats constantly, let alone their home decor. But looking dead was the fashion of the day. This look was specifically modeled after how tuberculosis affected you. Pale skin, watery eyes, red lips. While this disease was decimating the lower status, higher status women recreated it with makeup and arsenic consumption. You heard me right. In order to get pale skin, women consumed arsenic. In order to not die from arsenic, the consumer had to follow a careful process, eating small doses to build up a tolerance. Now, arsenic is addictive, so if they at any point stop the consumption, they would experience withdrawals such as vomiting, stomach pains, convulsions, hair loss, nervous system failure, kidney failure, delusions, the list goes on. Some women were stuck taking it for the rest of their lives. For the desired watery eye look, women would put citrus or even perfume in their eyes. Some went farther, using belladonna flower, also known as deadly nightshade, for longer lasting tears. However being poisonous, little wonder why blindness was a widely reported as a symptom of belladonna drops. No wonder it did such a good job. Red lip paint included? You guessed it, more poison. In this case, usually lead. All of these poisonous products would contribute to illnesses and facial decay. Death was of course a long term side effect of the usage once poisoning reached its crescendo. Suffice to say, while you may really want to fit in, some trends are not worth getting on board for, especially if they'll slowly melt your face off. Getting us started at number 10 is top hats. A top hat is an iconic image. You can see them in old black and white movies or on logos such as Mr. Peanut. But why were top hats created and why were they so trendy? Well, there's multiple reasons actually. Men and women were already wearing hats and bonnets to protect their heads from rain, wind, and the soot from local smokestacks. As a result, hats were already quite a trendy wear. However, the true reason for its popularity is what it represented. The top hat quickly became symbolic of status, power, and masculinity. From 1850 to 1900, men wore top hats for business, pleasure, and formal occasions. Certain colors were even associated with certain times of day. For example, a black top hat was for day or night, making its wearer feel taller, more handsome, even suave. Some were even reported to be a height of 12 to 14 inches tall. Top hats, amongst other hats of this era, also required ridiculous upkeep, such as being brushed, boiled regularly, powdered, etc. They also tend to contain mercury poison. As time progressed, we found other ways to overcompensate, as well as accessories rise our heads. So it's easier to see why the top hat never made a comeback. At number nine, tiny tea. During the Renaissance, fashion and beauty standards were changed drastically from what was popular in the years before. So much in society changed over this period of time, like what was seen as beautiful or desirable. Things like certain body types and other physical attributes had their own trends, but one of the weirdest physical beauty trends from back then had to do with teeth. Back then, the ideal woman had wide hips, a small waist, long legs, and small teeth. Yeah, teeth had an ideal size. To people back then, the smaller the teeth, the more desirable you were. Why? I don't know. 
because people are weird, I guess. Some people would even go as far as to file their teeth down to make them smaller so that people would see them as more attractive. Now, I can imagine that this would be a very painful process. Like if you've ever chipped a tooth, then you know that uncomfortable, almost cold sensation of a broken tooth. So imagine that, but on all of your teeth. Yeah, you can count me out. Before we carry on talking about some of these strange things people did to be the bell of the ball, and yeah, there were some really, really weird things, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, nails for days. These days, people get their nails done all the time. I love seeing crazy nail art videos online because they're often so creative. Some of the most fascinating ones are the crazy long nails. I don't think I could ever rock those, but I still admire those who can. The beauty trend of having long nails though isn't a new thing. It's been a symbol of beauty and status for many, many years, like years ago in China. Back then, having super long nails was seen as a way to show off your wealth and status. The average nail length amongst Chinese aristocrats was up to 25 centimeters or nearly 10 inches. This was all their natural nails too. And in order to protect their insanely long nails from breaking, they wore nail guards made out of gold. Not only did that protect their nails, but it was also another way of showing off their wealth because not everyone can live their lives wearing gold cages on their fingers. As you could imagine, having nails that long made it so you could barely do anything with your hands, and so that's why these aristocrats had servants, so they could perform the tasks that someone with super long nails couldn't. But would you ever want to have nails that long? <laughs> At number seven, long neck style. In many cultures around the world and for many years, having a long neck was considered beautiful and so many women practice neck stretching in order to attain this level of beauty. This practice of neck stretching has been most commonly done by wearing metal rings around the neck, adding more and more rings over time. This practice was first seen sometime around the 11th century in Southeast Asia. The theory behind the rings is that they're so thick that they push the head up, therefore stretching the neck, but in actuality, the lengthening of the neck is caused by the rings pushing down on the collarbones. The origin of this practice is pretty much unknown, but it is theorized that it began as a way to make women look more attractive in order to prevent getting captured as slaves, but on the other hand, some people believe that this was a way of protecting people from getting attacked by tigers. Two very different theories, but nonetheless valid. Though this practice began so long ago, it is still a traditional body modification in some parts of the world to this day. At number six, tiny tootsies. For many years, having the tiniest feet was seen as a popular beauty trend in China. Foot binding was a big body modification practice in China that began in the 10th century AD. It is said that this whole trend started because a court dancer bound her feet and the emperor at the time, Emperor Li Yu, really liked what he saw and soon it was encouraged for other women to do the same. Soon this practice of foot binding became a huge trend and it became associated with being able to find a husband. The practice of foot binding began when a girl was five or six years old. They would have their feet put in hot water, have their nails cut short, and have their skin rubbed with oil before having their four smallest toes broken, folded over, and tied down. Then their feet would be bent in the middle to break the arch, and the girl would have to walk around like that over time, crushing the heel and sole of the foot. After about two years, the foot would be considered ready, and depending on the size of the girl's foot by the end, this would judge how easily she'd be able to be matched with a good husband. This practice continued all the way until the 20th century, where it started to lose popularity. At number five, long skulls. One of the most bizarre beauty trends from ancient times, at least, was the process of head shaping. This unusual beauty trend caused caused people in modern times to think that aliens were real when remains were discovered with oddly shaped skulls. Some people believe that we had proven the existence of extraterrestrials, but in reality it led to the discovery of an entire practice of human body modification for the purpose of beauty. The process of head shaping involves putting some kind of pressure on a baby's head so that it grows into a different shape. This was known to be done by using cloth or even boards to create the desired shape. This is one of the oldest beauty trends in history as the earliest evidence of modified skulls come from Australia and date back between 14,000 and 9,000 years ago. The skulls that were found had flattened foreheads and very prominent brow ridges. This practice also occurred quite often in South America where skulls with a variety of different shapes have also been found. I'm kind of glad that we don't do this anymore because I could not imagine going through life with a cone head. I wonder how it would feel to have a head shaped like that. My neck hurts just thinking about it. At number four, 
five head. Let's go back to the renaissance for a bit to talk about yet another one of their super strange beauty trends. They really had a lot of weird desires when it came to appearances and I'm certainly glad that this next one is no longer in style and I really hope it never makes a comeback. Back in the renaissance it was believed that girls with high curved foreheads were the most beautiful but obviously not everyone can be built like that. As people do, they came up with a way of achieving this look without having to be born with said attributes. In order to have that big forehead that people so desired, women were known to have shaved or plucked the hairs from their natural hairline to make their foreheads look bigger and therefore more desirable. They really said, receding hairline, but make it fashion. I suppose. At number three, feet painting. Now you would think that all of the super bizarre beauty trends of the past were from way back in the day, but you would be mistaken. We saw some strange practices in the 20th century as well, especially during war times. Back in World War II, a shortage of silk and nylon in America created a bizarre beauty trend. Because these materials were needed to make things like parachutes and uniforms for troops, tights were quickly disappearing from stores. Because this was such a huge staple in women's fashion, they got creative and created a beauty trend where women would draw pantyhose arrows in their legs, dye them with different colors, and try and mimic the look of mesh tights to create an illusion close to wearing stockings. I feel like if this happened in today's time, I don't think I would be that desperate to do that, and you couldn't catch me drawing or dyeing my legs for this. I think I'll just stick to wearing pants. At number two, strange corsets. Corsets have been around for a long time. They've come in and out of style, and even right now, corsets seem to be making their way back into mainstream fashion, though maybe not as extreme as back in the day. In the 19th century, having an hourglass figure was seen as the ideal body type, and so in order for many women to achieve this look, they wore corsets to cinch their waist. However, the looks were pretty extreme. Some women tightened their corsets so tight that their waist could be wrapped with two hands. Like, imagine that. Although this was seen as super chic back in the day, it was also causing some health issues because it would squish together people's organs and as you can imagine, that's not a good thing. Eventually, corsets evolved so that rather than cinch the waist so much, it would just accentuate the hips to still give an hourglass shape without causing too much bodily harm. And finally, at number one, no-no piercings. How many of you guys out there have piercings? I have a few myself, I have my ears pierced, and obviously my nose is pierced, but there are so many other places that you can get pierced even in the no-no region. Back in the Victorian era, piercings down under were pretty popular and were considered to be very fashionable amongst wealthy women. Some women would have their nippies pierced and even chained together, and some men would even get their peepees some jewelry too. For women, it was all about trends, but for men back then, many of them got their nether regions pierced supposedly to make wearing tight pants more comfortable. This piercing was called the Prince Albert, and it was given that name based on the legend that Prince Albert got his little prince pierced in order to hide the size of his junk underneath his clothes. Whether or not that's actually true is beyond me, but I would imagine that getting that piercing would be painful. Absolutely painful. But remember, in the wise words of Beyonce, pretty hurts. Oh boy, was she right. Number 10, long neck. Look, this one probably isn't a surprise to anyone. There must be like 20 documentaries on the subject alone, but today we're talking about the long necked women found in some African cultures. In a nutshell, you pile on gold rings around your wife's neck until she's impersonating a totally winnable ring toss game at the county fair. The end result is a neck that's long just as the day is long. Pretty long. And in these cultures, this is considered very beautiful. Now, who am I to judge? I can't. However, as a lawyer, doctor, detective, and fireman here at Bumblebee, I'm gonna not recommend the giraffe look. While at first glance it may look like the neck is being stretched, it's really the shoulders that are being dropped forcibly by having so many rings piled up on your neck. That's just that's not healthy for you. Anyone in the comment section that has played contact sport will tell you that dropping your shoulders like that is not good. I like my thick neck the way it is, thank you very much. Number 9, food rations. I know, but listen. You just aren't you when you're hungry. Nobody can tell me that they feel pretty on an empty stomach. Am I right? Maybe less bloated, but still, you're not your best. Sadly for people living at home during the war, food rationing was quite common. Meats, grains, dairy, pretty much everything was needed to feed the troops. My grandparents always tell the story of them growing up during the war and that they would trade in tins of grease collected at home for free entry into the movie theater, which kind of makes sense. Which if you ask someone from that time is a big deal. The grease had multiple uses in the military. There's lots of uses for it. There's grease, guns, you need grease. You need, you need, you need the grease. Anyway. Number eight, Rivet Rosie. 
Every lady out there right now, young and old, has different fits. I just wear what's clean and what makes me look like a stereotypical Canadian. I do a lot of plaid, that's just how it goes. When you get to the club, that's a different fit from the one you wear from going to work, right? Well, despite the glamour and the chicness of 1940s in Hollywood, a lot of ladies had to go to work. Men were at war. You gotta, you gotta, fill, gotta fill the quotas, gotta fill it. Can't exactly show up to the bomb factory in a tight dress and heels for a long day's work, now can you? No, wouldn't be comfortable. Number seven, red for victory. Mustache man hated red lipstick. Yeah, I didn't know that either. But when a scary dictator man says no lipstick, that means no red lipstick. Whew, don't wanna cross out. The Western allies took this to their advantage. Marketing for this got a huge boost. As wearing the cosmetics that the angry German man didn't want you to, was thought to be contributing to the war effort, and honestly, it was. This is also impartial to inventing pinup girls, or at least the whole culture for them. The ladies all dolled up to stick it to the man in the eagle's nest, and gave the boys overseas something worth fighting for. That's right, ladies. Show them what they're fighting for. Number six, close shave. This one goes out to all the guys out there that sucked at shaving the first couple times they had to do it. I'm just one of them. Heck, who am I kidding? I'm still pretty bad at it. Maybe you shave too close and accidentally cut yourself. Shaved against the grain, or maybe you missed a couple hairs. That, that always happens to me. Keeping yourself groomed in the military is important. Ask any drill sergeant, they'll tell you. But can you honestly imagine trying to shave in a war zone? The only thing I would want to be doing is hiding or telling jokes. I would love to tell jokes in a war, but they don't exactly have private first class j jokers, do they? N no, they don't. I wouldn't last long, but yes, shaving was a part of military life. Completed with a tiny shave kit and mirror whilst under the watch of the enemy. No thank you. Number five, harmful products. Today, most folks are careful about what they put into them, but back in the day, not so much. When the war started, the military needed a lot of resources, like previously mentioned, and companies had to come up with alternatives. But when coming up with an alternative, testing may not have been done, or at least thorough. That means whatever they made could prove to be harmful to the user, like the radium girls from the First World War. Refer to my other video. My point is, this is a time when products that contain cyanide are sold on store shelves, so anything is possible which is just messed up. Watch what you're doing. Number four, good smoke. After a long day of receiving artillery and gunfire from German positions, a GI may not be looking himself, or probably doesn't feel himself either. Early stages of PTSD forming, most likely. So what can I do to improve this mood, they ask? And appearance? Why smoke a cigarette, of course, what else? Smoking culture was huge back then, and it wasn't seen by the public as a health risk. Lucky Strike cigarettes were packaged with soldiers' rations. They were given out cigarettes. It's just wild, you open up a can, there's my hand, there's my crackers, there's my smoke, so I'm good to go. Number three, nothing left. Unfortunately for a lot of cities in Europe, they got destroyed by bombing raids. Berlin in particular took a pounding. Pictures of the rubbled out city make you wonder how they ever rebuilt it. With that in mind, you can just imagine how beauty and fashion were the last thing on people's minds. Things like food, water, shelter, and fearing the sound of air raid sirens were more of a top priority. 1945 Berlin is not the place to head on down to the department store and pick out a new dress. You wear whatever you can find, and that's about it. Number two, strapped up. Bang, 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 bang. If you found yourself to be one of the lovely ladies of the French resistance, or really any resistance against the Germans during World War II, there was a good chance that you never left the house without your favorite accessory, ladies. Yes, that's right. A firearm. Across many nations in Europe, secret underground rebellions were being organized to overthrow their invaders. Allied forces even airdropped simple made firearms to resistance so they could get access to a better one with the one they dropped. It makes sense. How very James Bond of you. Oh, yes. <sighs> Behave. Number one, clean nails. Keep your nails clean and short. It's something I love to do. My nails get too long, I go straight for the pair of clippers. Having clipped nails and less hair was a part of every GI's routine. Besides looking dapper in a trench, the real reason was in case of chemical weapons and any toxic residue getting caught in beards, hair, nails, just anything like that really. Would that work? I mean, sort of, but just not being exposed would be a lot better of an option. Number 10, liquid stockings. When most people think of war, they think of side A versus side B. Man with gun, shoot other man with gun. Simple, right? To most, 
Yes, but the war departments and those behind the scenes know that the war is a logistical nightmare. Seriously. A lot of things on this list are because we needed to find alternatives. Millions of resources were pooled together to defeat the tyranny of fascism in World War II. Besides guns and ammunition, obviously, literally everything else is needed. Rubber, cloth, fabric, food, water, oil, grease, medicine, gas, men, and all kinds of metals. One of the things that was needed for the war effort was nylon, the same thing your grandma used for her stockings. So in Britain, when there was a shortage, the ladies did the next best thing and used a liquid to paint on their stockings. A classic example of keeping calm and carrying on. Way to go, ladies. Should be a bad idea though. If I started sweating on those, I'd have paint everywhere. It'd be really, it wouldn't be good, dude. It would not be good. Number nine, lead cosmetics. Did anyone know we still sort of do this today? Are we insane? Lead has been used in makeup for an extremely long time. It was found in cosmetics back in classical antiquity. So that's as far back as the 8th century BC. In the 18th century though, women would mix lead with vinegar to make themselves look more and more pale, which was a beauty standard back in the day. Gotta love looking like you never see the sun. Now, while the white lead that was used wasn't easily absorbed through the skin, the mixture of white lead with other chemicals and ingredients to create makeup and other products did indeed cause lead poisoning. And even though people knew this, they continued to keep on using it? Number 8. Jiggle Machines Oh, the great effort people will go to not make any effort. The self-exercisers or vibration machines were a popular fad back in the 1950s and 60s. The idea? Lose weight fast and easy with the help of modern science and machines. Trouble is, they, they don't really work at all. In a way, it's pretty similar to the snake oil men of the past. A common issue, a weird solution, and then a great marketing, well, that would make for a fad. Someone had to just make bank on it, I know they did. I mean, I get the appeal, I, I do. I wish I could be a 1950s housewife with a vibration machine, so I could be beach ready. But being a 1950s housewife means I'm so busy. But with a belt machine, it means I can keep my hands free, so I can reach for my favorite brand of menthol cigarettes and my third morning martini. Boy, I sure love this modern world. <sighs> wow. <laughs> Number seven, ear scoops. When I think of all the things I use a scoop for, I think of ice cream and sugar for my tea. Well now, I'm gonna be thinking about how people in the Viking era, all the way to the later post-Tudor times, used to scoop out their own earwax. Yes, an ear scoop was a tiny little brass or copper spoon with a twisted handle that went to a point. The spoon part was used for scooping, while the pointed end was used for pooping. No, I just wanted to say that. It was actually used for cleaning the fingernails of dirt. Thanks, ear scoops. Now I'm never going to look at a spoon the same way again. Number six, hangover mask. Okay, picture this. It's 1946. WW2 is over. Life's getting back to normal. You live in a major city, so you decide to take a night on the town with your friends. Well, one too many Manhattans later, and, well, you're not even sure if you're still on the island of Manhattan. You have what the drinkers of the world call a hangover. Let me know in the comments without too much grim detail about your worst hangover. What was your poison of choice? I'm curious. Many men and ladies have found themselves in bad places in the morning after uh, so many drinks. Only if there were something to cure said hangover. Well, ladies, you're in luck. The hangover mask aims to cure that. It's basically just a mask with plastic ice cubes. However, I'm gonna get a little personal and say that every hangover I've ever had, I didn't need a face mask. I needed some water and a bucket since the bathroom was too far away. I don't, I don't know why your, would your face need to be cold? I don't really understand that part, I don't know. Number five, tooth removal. Here, I found this quote from a dentist in the medieval period who would travel from town to town. Take some newts, buy some cold lizards, and those nasty beetles which are found in fens during the summertime. Calcine them in an iron pot and make a powder thereof. Wet the forefinger of the right hand, insert it in the powder, and apply to the tooth frequently, refraining from spitting it off. When the tooth will fall away without pain, it is proven. Hey, if it is proven, who am I to say otherwise? Just some lowly YouTube post. If you weren't using your Newton Beetle powder to remove your tooth, then it looks like you're going the much more old-fashioned tooth-pulling route. And that was much, much worse. They had rudimentary anesthetics that was possibly used then, but you had to worry about bleeding and infection. I think I'll stick with my uh, beetle newt powder. Number four, rejuvenique mask. 
I got another mask for you guys, I know. But I saw this and I, I just didn't know what to think, honestly. It's a mask that you wear, but it's plugged into a battery pack and it sends pulsations to your face. After, of course, you've applied the toning gel. What the heck is toning gel? I don't know. This is supposed to tone your face, apparently. Your jawline, or I just feel like plunging your face into a mask that's hooked up to a voltage. Uh, that's, a, that's just a bad idea. Oh, yeah, and also a bad idea is the mask itself. Look at this thing. I mean, th that's a heinous looking mask right there. You can come home from school one day, and your mom's gonna be sitting at the kitchen table looking up Michael Myers. Oh, that's not okay. Please don't do horror movie beauty stuff, ladies. Please, no. I don't wanna be scared. I don't like scary stuff. Number three, Spit Black. Back in the roaring 20s, they had mascara just like we do now. But unlike the little tubes of stuff we have, they had a block or cake of the stuff. To get it to a state where they could actually apply it to their lashes, they would need to add water. And what's the quickest form of water? That's right, it's your spit. The mascara cake stuff was made of soap and coloring, which you don't really want to put near your eyes. But then, knowing that people are using their spit to apply it, it's your own spit, so I guess if you're comfortable with that, you do you, pal, but Makes me think of dudes using their saliva to like lick their eyebrows. Ick. Number two, sharp teeth. I like Shark Boy and Lava Girl just as much as the next guy. However, that doesn't mean I want to look and feel like a shark. This one just creeps me out. I, I, I don't hate a dentist, but I think everyone can agree with me that teeth getting drilled is just uncomfortable. It just kind of sucks. Especially if there's like powdered tooth in your mouth. That's just the worst. It's kind of gross too. I don't know. Well, what I do know, however, is that there are some cultures out there where the ladies get their teeth sharpened or filed. Oh yes, and there ain't no dentist office there either. This is bite the leather, you're in dad's kitchen kind of operation. Oh God. I would honestly talk more about it, but the editor's gonna show some pictures and I'm gonna have to stop because if I see them, I legit get queasy. I don't wanna see that stuff. I, <laughs> no thank you, no teeth sharp. No, no. Number one, mercury laced skin cream. Secure Gorad's Oriental Cream and take your first step to a new lasting beauty. That's right, over time you too can develop dark rings around your eyes, lose some of those pearly whites, and get stunning black gums. That's because Gorad's Oriental Cream is made with calomel. What is calomel I hear you ask? It's a mercury compound. Yeah, it doesn't sound so good anymore, does it? While the woman of the 1920s who used this product maybe once or twice would be fine. Those who used it over long periods of time subjected themselves to mercury poisoning. But hey, Gorad's cream came in white, flesh, and whatever the hell color Rachel is supposed to be. Kicking off the list at number 10, eyelash extensions. Ugh, right off the hop, here we go. Nowadays, beauty products are safer, they're made in a cleaner way. We're going the right direction when it comes to putting things on or around our eyes. You know, thank God. But back in the late 1800s, we weren't quite there yet. No, not even close. This right here is an ad from the Independent Journal back from 1899. And it says, if your eyes are unattractive, you may make them irresistible by transplanting the hair. Just the hair. Transplanted eyelashes and eyebrows are the latest things in the way of personal adornment. An ordinary fine needle is threaded with a long hair, generally taken from the head of the person to be operated upon. Doink! Oh, let's do a little gray, why not? <laughs> yeah, they would use a white illicit substance that's illegal that I can't say on YouTube. They would rub that around your eyes just to numb the eyelids. How stupid is that? The doctor would thread the doctor would then thread your hair through the lids and then cut them down so they're even. Yeah, I thought peeling an eyelash off at the end of the night was bad. I would see that a lot, one of those. This is way worse. I'm never doing this. Number nine, Doramad toothpaste. Doramad. Are you mad? That should have been the slogan. Are you mad? The worst toothpaste to ever exist. Doramad, yeah, that was the one. Back in the 40s, people were brushing their teeth with radiation. Yeah, even on the actual tube, it says its radioactive ingredients increase the defense of teeth and gums. Mmm, I can feel it working already. Oh, I'm gonna throw up. Doctors hate this one trick. Here we go. The tube continues to, well, lie to its users, saying the radioactive cells are loaded with new life energy. The bacteria is then hindered in their destroying effect, leaving behind a pleasant and mild, refreshing taste. Awesome, yeah, I broke both my front teeth in half when I was younger. If only I had Doramad. 
I would have just bounced off the pavement and then just kept running. I would have had invincible teeth. Yeah, this toothpaste did not work and it did not stick around. It was horrible for humans. Its radioactivity was low in comparison, but like, its radioactivity was low. I can't even say that. Imagine this coming out now. No way. And just remember, good gums don't bleed. They glow. Doormad. Number eight, radioactive water. Yeah, you thought Dasani water was bad? Okay, just wait, buckle up. Back in 1932, Eben Byers, a 41-year-old steel manufacturer and golf pro, <laughs> hey -oh, met his fate in a horrible way. In a constant battle with arm pain and fatigue, Byers was told to drink radioactive water by his physiotherapist. And he was like, okay, you bet. Physiotherapist, anything you say, doctor. He said that drinking this product would help with the golfer's arm pain and fatigue magically, okay. Each of these bottles contained one microgram of radium and one microgram of esthorium. Yeah, the guy would drink radiation after every meal and subsequently lost weight, but sadly, he also developed bone necrosis in his jaw. Yeah, Dasani doesn't sound too bad now, does it? Number seven, Thoradia. If somebody told you that your face was glowing back in the late 30s, that would be the highest compliment. Now, it's got a little Edward Cullen vampire vibes. L little different now, but still nice. Thoradia was a beauty product company that made radioactive creams, powders, lipsticks, uh, anything to get your glowy glam on, they made. And they made it in a horrible way. They made thorium and radium lead products to tone facial tissues and remove wrinkles. How insane does that sound coming out of my mouth? Look at cosmetic companies now. Imagine Thoradia just dropping on shelves casually. The product was doing so well that it circulated in Italy, Portugal, Romania, Egypt, Belgium, France, you name it, it was all over the world. It wasn't until 1937 until the French government caught on to these horrible side effects, thank God, and then they pulled it from shelves. Imagine seeing a friend and they're literally glowing, vampire for sure, or radiation. Number six, the trico system. I was talking about plucking my uh, unibrow the other day. I was really going in on that, so. We had to throw this one in. Instead of plucking your eyebrows in the late 1920s, you would ideally want to use the trico system to remove any, you know, unwanted hair. This device was booming back in the 20s. Hair salons had to have this system. And come 1925, there were over 75 trico systems installed in beauty shops all around. And what you would do is you would sit at this large desk, face a small window for a few minutes, and boom, just like that, hair gone. Yeah, just 20 quick visits to your local trico system and then boom, then your hair is magically gone. Just 20 visits, easy. You have the time of the day, right? Their trick here was x-ray technology directly on their face. Not a, not a bright idea. So four years later in 1929, trico system side effects were so well known, you know, being ulcers, carcinoma, keratosis, death. This was not the solution you wanted. So again, pulled from stores. Number five, Gorad's cream. Gorad's Oriental Cream hit the market back in 1936. This cream was supposed to, you know, freshen up your skin, make you look lighter, younger, tighter, whatever Paul Rudd's doing. But instead, this skin cream had one user ending up in a book that's very, you know, Chamber of Horror styles. Just what not to do in terms of cosmetics and bad stuff. This magic ingredient was meant to magically make you beautiful, and it had some magic mercury inside the product, it was horrible. Not something you want on your face ever. Mercury, no fun, I don't recommend. Zero out of five, my friend. The results were haunting. This woman had soon developed black gums, her teeth loosened, and dark rings appeared around her eyes. It was haunting. It's called mercury poisoning, and it's not fun. Number four, fluoroscope. A proper measurement of the foot is the first step to a healthier lifestyle. If you're off by half a size in either width or length, you're setting yourself up for future problems. So when x-rays started being used to properly measure up family foot sizes in shoe stores, well, it sounded like an ideal start to an otherwise exhausting process. I worked in a shoe store while I was in school, so I get it, you know? The amount of stinky feet I've had to measure up with that metal cold, really cold metal thing? No thank you, gross. So in comes this new fluoroscope technology, right? Measure your feet, but make it cool, make it futuristic, right? Make it technological. This began in the 1920s. Everybody used these things, it was completely normal, and by the time the 40s rolled around, scientists were now concerned about the radiation level emitting off these machines, and eventually they too were banned. They're also really intimidating to look at. There's a speedometer on it, like for some reason. It doesn't look like an easy thing. It's, uh, it looks scary. It looks like a saw trap, you know what I mean? Number three, thallium. In the late 19th century, something called thallium acetate started to sweep the nation. It was a hair removal method, but originally thallium was prescribed for those who suffered with ringworm. Just in case you got both, here you go. 
So yeah, now we're getting a little concerned historically. Even so, thallium didn't do anything about said ringworm. That in itself was already a failed product. It made patients' hair fall off. So the ringworm was easier to find. Doesn't actually help the issue, just makes it easier to find, I guess. So I guess that's helpful, I don't know, it's still bad. Eventually thallium was sold by itself as a cream. It's very toxic, it should never touch your skin. This was once rat poison, historically, and then humans were then rubbing it around on their heads, casually. And that, that's insane. This was outlawed in the 30s, thankfully, but the fact that this was ever sold in history just baffles me. This whole list baffles me. Number two. Aqua Tifana. I love this one. Going back to the 1600s for this one. If you're a murderino, you know this one already. It's a good one. Aqua Tifana was a cosmetic that was sold to women back in the early 1600s. It was a cosmetic that also doubled down as a poison. Yeah, some naughty stuff going on here. The origins of said deadly cosmetic that was sold and, you know, responsible for around 600 deaths is pretty wild. Back in 1632, two women, Francesca Lasarda and Tafiana D'Amato, they both created this poison so that when their husbands kissed them on the cheek, they would then be poisoned from the cream that they put on, right? This was a time where women were treated horribly, right? Like, even worse than now, you know what I mean? Like. I was gonna say a time where women had less rights, but I'm like, eh, we're actually getting worse historically, so who knows? But eventually, Tiafana was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe, her recipe lived on. Her recipe carried on through her daughter, Yulia Tiafana. She took this deadly recipe to Rome and kept manufacturing it. Pretty badass, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, obviously it's horrible in so many ways, but I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty smart, I think. Like if she was a villain in a Sherlock Holmes movie, we'd love her, you know what I mean? Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and belladonna. Colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. And finally, number one, Vita Radium Suppositories. Hey, my favorite one historically, this is great. With guaranteed real radium, there we go, just in case you got that fake stuff, this is the real good stuff. The Home Products Company of Denver, Colorado came out with these suppositories, you know, back in 1930. And the way that they marketed these things is so funny and I have to end the list on it. It's one of my favorites ever. The company reaches out and says, weak discouraged men. If you are showing signs of slowing up in your actions and duties, perhaps if you have begun to lose your charm, your personality, your normal manly attitude, then certainly you want to stage a comeback. The man who has lost these precious attributes of youth knows how to appreciate their value. He realizes that happiness depends on his ability to perform the duties of a real man. Sweet glorious pleasures of life. Nature intended that you should enjoy them. Now is the time to act. And then these real men put radiated suppositories up their real How funny is that? They're like, are you a man? Yeah. Do you want to get back to business? Yeah. All right. Bend over. It's so stupid. This is so dangerous also, obviously, but like, it's so funny that they're so aggressive with this ad. Huh. The initial goal here was to, of course, feel better and, you know, feel like a real manly man again. But instead of waking up feeling refreshed, users eventually stopped waking up altogether. Number 10, the cholera belt. This is just so silly to me. While the Victorian era seems like a long, long time ago, it's really only like three to four people ago. So yeah, your, your grandparents or maybe even your great grandparents could have experienced a life like this. As we all know, disease was rampant back then and thank God we're a little less gross now, am I right? Well, cholera was quite the tummy bug going around back then, causing upset stomach indigestion and the Oregon Trail's favorite, diarrhea. Ooh, no thanks. So the people of Victorian times came up with something that, well, wasn't only functional, but fashionable too. Very nice. The cholera belt was a piece of red fabric that was to be wrapped around the belly to keep you warm. That's because people thought having a cold belly caused cholera. Because yeah, that's, that's, that devil gives you cholera. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. That's what does it. It's not. It's a, it's a sickness. It's a virus. Number nine, royal bite. It would be difficult to specify a queen who had this done, as there are probably simply too many. And it's more of a, well, service, I guess, than a product, but hear me out. Something I'm just extremely fascinated in and frightened by at the same time. Taking place in Africa, Asia, and the South Pacific Islands. Your dentist's worst nightmare. Teeth sharpening. Ooh. Considered to be a thing of beauty. Many women, and even recently, have undergone this process of 
jungle dentistry. I for one cannot judge someone else's culture, however, I can judge the experience of acquiring such a look. And I know that just can't be fun. You ever get a cavity removed at the dentist and buddies just drilling into your tooth like John D. Rockefeller looking for some oil? Okay, well imagine someone filing your teeth down like a high school woodshop project. Yeah, no thanks. I get shivers just thinking about it, and all that blood and the powdered teeth just piling up in your mouth, and there's no suction thingy? Nah, that's just the worst, man. Nah, I, that ain't it. I talk to the chief, he's a dentist. That, that ain't it. Number eight, shampoo. What's better than having a hot shower after a long day and just, just rinsing off the woes of the day? Honestly, it's one of my favorite things. For me, a nice hair wash feels good with my favorite shampoo. And because I'm a guy, my body wash, shampoo, and conditioner are all the same product. It's what we do. However, queens of the Inca civilization had more lucrative beauty products to say the least. I say product because this was a process. What am I talking about? <laughs> Fermented urine. What else, of course? Yes, that's right, the Inca's favorite way to combat those dry scalps was the forbidden lemonade. That's just gross, don't drink that. They would have clay pots filled with the golden broth and then it was cast aside to really let those flavors come together. Or at least I think that's what's happening, that's something a chef would say. Anyway, once it reached the desired level of fermentation, it was then used to clean hair. Oh man, what a way to make a queen stay fresh. Just message to the Incas, just stick to soap, man, don't do that. Imagine just like having a just one just oh just love, it feels so good. Oh it smells great. I love this. This is fantastic. I love this is so great. I love this. Number seven, foundation. Sometimes all a girl or a queen needs is a little foundation. After all, who doesn't want to have a gorgeous glowing complexion? Especially if you're a queen. The royalty of ye olde Europe felt the same way, except their products were a little different than to what a queen would have today. Some products are hard to pitch and market, but this uh, this would be even hard to market in a Super Bowl commercial. The queens of ye olde Europe fell into a trend of having pale skin. So, to achieve this mixture, it was a mixture of lead and vinegar to coat the face that gave the desired pale look. That just sounds awful. Talk about scandalous. Our queen's makeup makes her smell like she's been working away in a lead mine all day. Naturally, this couldn't have been pleasant, but a girl's gotta do what a girl's gotta do. Beauty is pain, and sometimes it's really stinky. Number six, cowboy action. Okay, not exactly a queen, but pretty close. Hear me out, guys. Sarah Winchester was the widow and the heiress of the Winchester rifle fortune. This included $20 million and 50% of shares of the company. Man, I wish that was me. And in case you didn't know, the Winchester rifle company was responsible for making guns good when a lot just weren't. And that model of rifle unfortunately took a lot of lives. So it's said that the Winchester mansion was haunted by the ghosts of the poor souls who found themselves at the business end of a repeater. Sarah allegedly was missing a few cards from the deck. All sixes and nines, just, just a little crazy. So in her craziness, it's fair to say she spent some time with a Winchester rifle or two, which is quite a scandalous product for a queen who thinks she's seen ghosts. Plus. Women back then, besides Annie Oakley, weren't supposed to handle things like that because it was the 1800s and men were just really mean and stinky and come on guys, give her a break. I ain't that woman can't shoot a gun. What are you talking about? Number five, toxic eyes. It's no mystery that beauty products today can be filled with all kinds of lovely chemicals that make you look great. And there's tons of products from the past that could be labeled as scandalous. Well, how about putting literal poison in your eyes? Yes, that's right. Back to the women of Eolde Europe. The very same queens with the pale skin wanted eyes that sparkled. How to achieve this? Well, you just put drops of belladonna in, in your eyes, which, if you didn't know, is poison. Like, just straight up poison. It's bad. It would dilute the eyes, and that was considered beautiful. If you think that sounds like it's bad for your health, that's because it is. Long-term exposure to the belladonna drops would lead to blindness. Yeah, kind of a trade-off there. Good looking eyes, go blind later. Yeah, no thanks. Number four, the neck stretcher. No, that is not a WWE wrestler or finishing move, although it really sounds like one, it could be. No, this is something I've always been fascinated with, really, it's just kind of out of this world. I'm talking about neck rings from some African and Asian cultures. Basically, over there in some cultures, the more a woman looks like the Kaminoans from Attack of the Clones, the better. And that means it's time to stretch the neck by slowly placing rings around a young woman's neck until it grows. And then you keep slapping those bad boys on until you've got so many rings on your neck, it'll make you say Sifo Dias. 
Had to fit a little Star Wars in there somewhere. Truth be told, the neck doesn't actually stretch. It's more the shoulders are dropping from all that weight, which can weigh up to like 15 pounds or something. It's crazy. And if common folk take part in this lengthy procedure, the most beautiful of queens certainly did too. Number three, this, this makes no sense. Look, with all the crazy, super awful, weird things that humans have done, at least most of the time in my opinion, there's a method to the madness. Poisonous eye drops do make your eyes pretty, sure. The urine shampoo does get rid of my dandruff, okay. But with this one, I mean, there's just no way. It, it just doesn't make sense. And I would have no idea how to present this to royalty, especially the queen of the Nile. Toothpaste made from mice, yes. Just how though? I, I, it doesn't make any sense. Like how is a mouse supposed to make your breath feel fresh over some herbs and nicer smelling things? Basically, you cut the mouse in half, like that's a normal thing to do, and then you put that in your mouth. Also, have you ever tried catching a mouse? That's not easy. Is there a mouse farm? So many questions. To me, it's just a really bad look to have the queen swishing around half a mouse in her mouth like some of Listerine's finest mouthwash. Ugh. Number two, blondes have more fun. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a popular hair color. And believe it or not, I used to have natural blonde hair, like super blonde. And then Harambe left this plane of existence and my hair got darker. Cause life got darker. Now all I want to do is listen to MCR in my room and write in my journal about how nobody understands me while MTV plays on the TV my parents bought me in the background. Some people want to go blonde. This was true of royal women in ye olde times. So time to reach for some good old fashioned hair dye right off the shelf, right? Let's read the ingredients together. Water, well, that's good, okay. <laughs> I got a water. <laughs> a lead, well I got tons of that on my face already, so that's fine. And was this, sulfur? What? Yeah, that's right, that's <laughs> sulfur. Imagine slathering that stinky goodness all in your locks. This was something that the highly esteemed Tudor women actually did, or at least tried. I feel like you need a whole truck of this stuff to work. But then again, the smell. That's not how a queen should smell, is it? It's not right now, you shouldn't, it's not. Number one, the Canary Girls. When Great Britain was at war, the queen was a symbol of their freedom and democracy. True British strength to keep on carrying on. So the next time the queen goes to visit a munitions factory to cheer on the women who are working hard day and night for the war effort, she might want to keep her distance. The high explosives used in the artillery shells, famously known as TNT, I'd break down the scientific name, but we all know <laughs> my track record with reading. <laughs> I can't. It is a very volatile substance, but not just for the explosive capabilities, but it's also toxic. Yeah, I didn't know this, I learned this. Very similar to the radium girls of the same fate. TNT with enough exposure can turn skin and hair a yellowy orange color. Now, we can't have her royal majesty showing up somewhere looking like Big Bird, can we? To avoid being a literal blonde bombshell, perhaps stay away from the factory, your royal highness. Number 10, Queen of the Nile. For me, it's fun to think about the day in the life of an ancient Roman or Egyptian. I can only hope it was as beautiful as textbooks, movies, and video games make it out to be. But something that I find interesting is that the Egyptians were using makeup all those years ago. Yes, that's right, Cleopatra being the bougiest of all the queens to ever grace our presence, or at least so Elizabeth Taylor would make me think so, had her fair share of makeup use. However, something that may not be fit for a queen was the Egyptian eye glitter. Oh boy, here we go. To achieve this, colorful insect beetles were crushed up and added to an applicable powder, where you would then brush that on your eyes. Look, bugs don't gross me out, but I don't exactly know if I'd want that all up in my business. To be fair, we shouldn't be grossed out because uh, I hate to tell you, but there's some products we still use today that might have a cup or two of bugs in it, just saying. Number nine, Shields Arsenic Green. For some reason, green was all the rage back in Victorian times. I'm not sure why, I'm personally not a fan of green, but except for the green screen, we love that. I know you guys can't see that, but I love, I love the green screen. When I was a paint mixer, sometimes people would bring up the wildest colors for me to mix, and they weren't for art projects, they were for walls. So weird, but I digress. There was a common color back then called Shields Green. It was made in a lab by a spooky, scary Swedish guy named Shield. Huh, go figure. This color was used in everything, dresses, fabric, paint, you name it. The trouble is, it was a compound of copper and arsenic. Therefore, it was toxic and caused a lot of harm. It also had links to cancer. For example, when Napoleon was banished to St. Helena, the walls of the house he was staying in were painted with shades of shield. Eee, that's not good. Pretty sure he died of stomach cancer too, so there's a connection there. Number eight, beetle dresses. 
Like I said, the green color was really in at the time, and there were other ways of achieving such a gorgeous glow besides using shield paint. Similar to how Cleopatra made her eyeliner, some dresses in Victorian times were made with pieces of beetle. Ugh. I'm sure there are some folks out there who probably don't mind that, but for the rest of us that don't care for Halloween or My Chemical Romance and Tales from the Crypt Keeper, hard pass. Basically, any beetle or colorful bug that wings, or I guess caprices, was worth keeping was prepared and sewn into fabric. The finished product doesn't look like it came from creepy crawlies, it actually looks kind of good to be honest. Mind you, this is a time when a lot of things were still done by hand, so there's a little bit of love in each beetle you stitch, that's kind of nice. Mom, mom helped out with that one, that was nice. Number 7, wearing black for weeks. Losing a family member is tough, life can get hard. In Victorian times, passing away was a big deal. There was usually a big funeral, flowers, tears, everything, the whole works. The crazy part is, you were expected to wear black or mourning clothes, as they were called, thought to be an outward expression of one's emotions and feelings. However, it's not like that one funeral of the distant uncle you had, where as soon as you got home, you ripped off your suit and hopped on Call of Duty to see what your friends are doing. Oh, on the contrary, my ninja diffusing friends, because in Victorian times, your search and destroy matches would require you to wear those black mourning clothes for a long time, sometimes even weeks and months on end. Queen Victoria wore hers for years after her husband passed, and it was odd to see her in anything but black. That's a weird story. That's crazy. Number 6, Annaline Dye. In 1856, William Henry Perkin was trying to create an anti-malaria drug using aniline. After all, the British were spending an awful lot of time in foreign nations doing as the British do and needed a cure to keep doing what they do. Well, he did not find a cure for malaria, but he did discover it makes a very lovely dye that makes deep reds, purples, and black. You need that for the funerals. Naturally, this picked up a lot of steam and began to be used in everything from socks to shoe polish. Yeah, I know, right? Trouble is, once people got enough exposure to the clothing with aniline dyed, their skin would go red, itchy, inflamed, and was known for causing really bad headaches. That's because it would absorb to their skin and poison their blood. That sounds pretty <laughs> Actually, I don't, I don't want that. Number five, zinc chlorine coats. This one's bad, man, but it was stopped before it became a trend, thank God. Picture this, it's Victorian London and you're but a humble city servant. Your job is to clean the streets. One night it begins to rain, as it is known to do in England. I hear it rains there a lot, I don't know. And the city provides these humble men with coats that have a zinc chloride layer in the fabric. It was supposed to protect against rain and, and wetness and whatnot. A lot of chemistry in this video, but some might already guess that this was a bad idea. Zinc chloride is not only corrosive, but water soluble. So after a shift in the rain, a lot of these men came back with really nasty chemical burns. And no, they didn't have emergency showers like in Heisenberg's RV. They didn't have that. Or your high school chemistry class it was really bad. They stopped it immediately because that's really bad. Number four, asbestos fabrics. Crystal like this, he'll remember these. Picture this, it's 2004. It's Saturday afternoon and your dad just got finished watching an episode of Trucks. Nice. And now you have control over the TV remote. Saturday morning cartoons, here we come. I used to love the Kirby show. He's one of my favorites. Love that guy. But just before you change the channel, there's a commercial with an old man who looks very concerned and he says have you been affected by mesothelioma and or because of exposure to asbestos then you may be qualified for compensation I believe it went something like that maybe I should call Saul Goodman Where's he when you need him? All jokes aside, those commercials were not joking. They weren't joking around at all because it's been known asbestos was very harmful for a long time. So yeah, it was pretty bad. Victorian times were no different. Mostly using things to protect from heat or fire. And while it did do the job somewhat, it was very harmful for the lungs. And like the old man says in the commercial, it could be cancerous, hence mesotheliomia. I, I said it right there. I said it the first time when I was impress impersonating him, and now I can't say it. Mesothelioma. There it is. Mesothelioma. Number three, radium makeup. Okay, sure. I'll give you that radiation and radioactive materials were pretty much being discovered and barely understood for the time. Okay, sure. It was new. Look at Madame Curie. Tragic story there. So when the very interesting radium was discovered, it got thrown into everything because yeah, why not? Radium makeup, radium watches. You name it, radium was in it. 
While at first exposure to radium, you'd be fine, not too much to worry about. However, after years of direct physical contact on the skin, yikes, there's going to be a problem. It's radioactive. It's the reason why you shouldn't get too many x-rays. Not that it's radium, I'm just saying radiation in general is not good for you. Not much to explain in this one, except it was used and manufactured in women's makeup, and they used it. And I, I'm sorry, I, that's, just, that's just rough. Number two, mercury hats. Mercury was nothing new in the medical field in Victorian times. It had been used in ancient China for a long time before that. And yes, it was poisonous. It was harmful to you. However, in Victorian times, some hats included mercury in their production process. Now, why is that so bad? Well, because mercury makes you go insane. Hence why they called it Mad Hatter's Disease. I could not think of a worse name for a disease. Now, not that it's a fashion point, but this was also readily used for treating syphilis at the time. So something that's readily available for the public and health would wind up in closed production. It makes sense. If there's a lot of it, sure, it makes a lot of sense. But it makes people go crazy. That's... Sorry, who's talking to me? What? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> joke, funny. Number one, cellulose nitrate. This one's crazy. As you can tell on this list, there's been a lot of clothes and fabrics mixed with some naughty chemicals. Naughty. Of course, this is years before OSHA or Wemyss, so it probably wouldn't happen today. However, this one takes the cake. When cotton, or a cotton-like product, is introduced to nitric acid, it forms cellulose nitrate, which is also known as flash cotton. Not because it takes its shirt off at an edgy concert, but because I cannot stress this enough how unstable and flammable it really is. Even the slightest heat source could set it off. There's even stories of people spontaneously combusting after being exposed to items made with such. The lights in the studio, they'd probably set it off. That's how, that's how.